Hello and welcome to Beneath the Surface. Glad you could join us today. Paul Morano here with my guest, Mr. Bob LeBlanc. And tonight we delve beneath the surface on the topic of the five sorrowful mysteries as they relate to the passion of Christ. Woohoo! Mr. Robert, welcome to Beneath the Surface. You ready to delve? I guess we are. You ready to spiritually rock, are you? I am. Well, this is the big time of the holy year. I mean, it's the big time of the year. Holy week of, of the year, the liturgical year. Um, this is the high point. This is what we are going through Lent for. Yes. Yes. And Lent is how many days for those um, who are not uh, Catholic or Christian in our audience? Well, nominally, it's 40 days, but the, the numbers don't quite add up if you try to figure from Ash Wednesday to either Good Friday or, or um, uh, Easter Vigil. It doesn't quite add up to 40. But of but course, that, it represents, it's symbolic of the 40 days that Jesus fasted in the desert, which, yes. which represents the 40 days in the desert that the, 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 the people of Israel uh, after they were freed from slavery on the on route to the promised land. And uh, there are a lot of 40 day and 40 year motifs in the Bible, aren't there? Right, right. It seems that the number 40 seems to represent a, a, a time of trial. Uh, yeah. And another one that comes to mind is um, Noah's Ark, where Noah was there for 40 days and 40 nights until finally things dried up. And Exodus. And Exodus. 40 years. Absolutely. Okay, so, so you're saying that Holy Week is the pinnacle, the high point of the Lenten season. Right. Well, I would, I would uh, go even further. I would say uh, Holy Week is the high point of the year period, uh, the entire year. Uh, w w the thing that we have to remember is that Holy Week ends with Easter, and this is where, that's what makes everything make sense. Yes. So everything is, uh, everything is a preparation for, uh, you know, the resurrection. But in order for the resurrection to make any sense, you need to go through the passion. Why? So, Why? Uh, because it's through it's through this suffering, um, and death that Jesus uh, defeats death and sin. Why do you think? Um, and I'm just going to play devil's advocate with you, just just to get get beneath the surface here. Why do you think God couldn't have just waved his imaginary, it's not imaginary, his uh, metaphorical hand and have just wiped away human death? Why, why go through all of this suffering, bringing, you know, incarnating, going all through all the suffering and death in order to conquer death? Well, um, I, I know the reasons you, that you would give, and, <laughs> and I think they're good reasons, uh, but I think for some people that's probably not satisfying. But the, the, the reason is, is that there are consequences for your actions. There are consequences for sin. Uh, what happened is that we turned away from God. Uh, collectively, we turned away from God in the, in the story of Adam and Eve, our first parents. Yeah. And uh, so somebody had to pay that price. Somebody of, of turning away, of the human race turning away from God. Right, from, from turning away from God. And... Uh, you know, and the thing is, is that God is an infinite being. So the sin that we commit against God is infinite. And therefore, human beings just by themselves cannot pay that price. And so this is, goes to the reason for the incarnation. So it's, so, so it's an infinite offense against the infinite and eternal majesty of God. Therefore, something much greater than our finite uh, being uh, must pay for it because we're unable to, right? Exactly. Is that what you're saying? You, you, know, you know, an analogy I, I have given in the past is that um, a parent says to a child, don't go near my expensive vase. Uh, we just paid X amount of hundreds of dollars for it. So in disobeying the mother, the kid goes and plays near the vase and um, even intentionally knocks it over. It breaks into a million pieces. Now the kid cries he, he truly, sincerely apologizes, but the, the vase is still broken into a million pieces. How can he fix that? Right. He, isn't, he does not have the capability. Doesn't have the power. Now, he easily has the power to destroy it. Yes. Just like Adam and Eve had with the world, and, and we do with our sin. 
but it's impossible literally for him to fix what he broke. So in order for, in order for somebody to fix that, fix what we broke, that is bringing sin into the world and fracture everything that God created, God himself had to come down, become incarnate, become one of us, and stand in for us vicariously, right? As the new Adam, representing us like the first Adam represented us, to fix what Adam broke. Yes? Yes. Um, the, the, I, I guess the, the, the th kind of thing that I really key on here is, is, is that, that God uh, took on our humanity. What he did he, in the in an incarnation, he, he took in the story, in our salvation story, he took the first steps toward that restoral. Of course, the, all of salvation history is kind of a preparation for the incarnation, but the final stages and the beginning of the final stages is the incarnation when God takes on a human nature um, yes. uh, until the end of time. Uh, you know, God will have, I mean, Jesus will be uh, God and man uh, from that point on, from the po point of, on of the incarnation. So he will, he will always be a, he will always be a God man. Right, right. Yeah, so with a divine and a human nature. Right. Yeah. All right. So God took on a human nature in order to fix what Adam and us, because none of us are perfect. We've all sinned. We've all contributed to this, this tainting and um, you know, destruction of, of, of the, the pristine goodness and perfection of the world with our sins. And so, you know, there is an argument, particularly it was centered, I think, between the Franciscans and the uh, and the Jesuits of the Franciscans. No, the Jesuits weren't around. No, then. no, no. It was the, I the think Dominicans. It was Dominicans. Of, yeah. yeah as to whether as to whether God would have come down and taken on a human nature just to be one of us and 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 have that closeness with us, but I guess practically speaking, it it doesn't matter because we did sin, uh, and so God took on our human nature in order to conquer the effects of sin, which the ultimate effect is death. So to conquer sin and death, and in doing that, he did that on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Right, yes. Uh, well, I mean, we celebrate this, and, and I want to uh, in include this because it's an important part of Holy Week, uh, yeah. the Easter Vigil. Uh, there's something that we, we have, uh, a lot of Christians celebrate this, is called the Triduum. And uh, it's, it starts with the Last Supper, and, and that's important liturgically, and I want to get to that. I don't know if you want to talk about it now. Well, I, I'd like to go through the sorrowful uh, mysteries of the rosary one at a time, and we'll, sure we'll get into that. And as a matter of fact, that is the first sorrowful mystery. So why don't we get into that right now? The first sorrowful mystery um, is the agony of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right. Uh, the word Gethsemane, interestingly, is, means oil press. And um, Jesus is, um, is in the Garden of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, where he um, is praying to the Father fervently. And he tells his apostles, particularly his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, um, just stay here for just an hour. Stay up with me and pray with me. And then he goes over further into the heart of the garden and he prays to the Father. Yes, and, and that is a, a very significant moment. One, it tells us that Jesus is praying, and I, I don't believe that Jesus in his divinity needed to pray to the Father, but Jesus in his humanity, he needed yes. to pray to the Father. They're, 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 we, and it, it establishes that, that communion that we should be trying to make with the Trinity yeah. uh, in praying to God. Uh, and so... And the thing is, is what he's praying about is also very, very important. Yes. Uh, you know, you, you find this particularly in the Gospel of John, don't you? John chapter 17. Oh, well, you're, 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 are, I think you're going to talk about that we're one. Yeah, may the Father and I be one. But you want to get into the Synoptic Gospels where he speaks about uh, take this cup. So why don't you get into that? Sure. So, right. so uh, Jesus goes and prays to the Father and he asks that this cup be taken away from him. Yeah. And, and then he says something very, very significant, not as I will, but as you will, as the father wills. 
um, which is which is the very beginning of the the prayer that he gave us the the our father you know who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy will yeah. be done yeah thy kingdom uh, come thy will be done yeah um and so uh so what he's what he's showing there that that he is fully human as well as fully divine where you get the the fully divine is in other places but here he's emphasizing his his human nature he has a human intellect and a human will yeah which must submit to the father's will to the divine will uh, in order for us to be reconciled right to to give this a a, a different and a, a complementary spin or uh, uh, angle to it you could say that in the original garden of eden god offered mankind in adam a covenant yes now, a, a sacred covenant is you know an offer of a love relationship a love union that will last forever um, and that union that love union between god and man was rejected in adam and eve of course and of course the rest is salvation history but here comes jesus the new adam who is fervently praying in the new garden, right? From Eden to Gethsemane. Um, and here he is saying, Father, um, you know, basically it seems like he's saying, I, I, in my human nature, I'd rather not suffer. Who, who enjoys suffering? Right, exactly. Take, take this cup away from me. Now, the fourth cup, this relates to the fourth cup. Jesus in the Last Supper with his, uh, his disciples, drank three cups of wine, just like at the original Passover. Last Supper was, of course, a usurping of the Jewish Passover. That fourth cup, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, represented the cup of suffering. So he left the fourth cup at the Last Supper. He goes to the, 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 the new garden of Eden, which is the Garden of Gethsemane, you could say, and he says, Father, take this cup away from me, the cup of suffering. However, or but, or whatever the word is, may your will be done, Father, not mine. And that, those last few words, are the exact contrary to what Adam said and did. Yes. And, and, and hence, Jesus formally, not materially, the material act happens on the crucifixion, uh, on the cross. But formally, he gives his will up right there to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, Whereas the original Adam who broke our relationship with God basically said no to God. Well, yes. St. Paul talks about how Jesus is made perfect in his obedience. And, and what, he, what we're talking about is we're going all the way back to the beginning. You know, where, where Jesus is now in his obedience undoing the disobedience of the first parents. Big time. And, and, and this is how Jesus completes his mission. Well, he, he's agreeing, he's formally agreeing to be obedient even to the point of death. And of course, that's calling back uh, to, I think it's Second Philippians, where, yes. where, where uh, Paul is, is talking about, you know, Jesus being obedient even to the point of death. And this is, right. this is un, undoing of all the sin. He's paying all this price for all this sin that, that's not done even in the past, but all sin that's been done, going to be done in the future. He's paying it all. He's paying the entire price of, of sin. Imagine that. Vicariously, he's taking that all on. He's taking the hit for us. Right. So that and we I don't suffer eternally. And, and I, I, I think I need to add this because I've encountered this with uh, uh, catechism students. Mm. Um, you know, one, one student asked me once is, is you know, did, did the father really send his son to, to take this punishment for all of us? And, and the, he seemed to be focusing on how, what is this vindictive father who sends his son to, to pay this price? And, and uh, my response is, and I think it's, it's a good on the spot sort of response is, no, that's not really the way to think about this. The way to think about this is that God loved us so much and the son loved the father so much and the son loved us. So what, what happens is 
the father and the son, they decide between the both of them, or they, they share the same divine will. They decide, well, out of love, the son will stand in the place of humanity and take on the punishment. Is that it's, it's, it's up what you would do in maybe another human circumstance where a person is really messed up. Right. But a person, another person who loves them goes and steps into whatever mess that person has created. So give me the punishment. Give me the punishment. I'll yeah. take the sacrifice for this. And I think that's a, an extremely important point to point out here, that a, a very severe punishment is necessary in order to bring a, back justice between the divine uh, life of God and us. It's, it's not, it, it's, it's completely reasonable that something so, so terrible um, had to be done in order to take away our sins, to, to atone for everything that we've done as a human race. And, and, and there's also this. And only there's God also, could do it. Uh, there's also this, and I think it's lost for many Christians, is, is that suffering now becomes, has meaning. Suffering now is salvific. Uh, Christ's suffering uh, on the cross or in, during his entire passion is salvific. Therefore, human beings can unite their suffering to the suffering of Jesus during his passion. Yes. And therefore, their own suffering takes on some meaning. And, and a person can offer up their own particular suffering to help Jesus out. Not that Jesus needs any help, but join, joining your suffering to Jesus, yeah. you, can, you can go and, and, and supply the graces maybe for yourself or for somebody else. Well, and, and another reasonable way of, of looking at that is that literally uh, we are the mystical body of Christ. We are baptized yeah. into Christ. So when the head, who is Christ, and we are the body, when the head is crucified and suffers for the salvation of many, so too does his body have to follow the head in that suffering so that the, the entire mystical person of Christ, him, which is the body and the church, which is, excuse me, him, which is the head, Christ himself and the church, which is the body, we all suffer for the sake of, um, of, of the salvation of the world. Of course, he is the, the, the chief uh, sufferer and we united with him as a body to a head. But if I could go back a little bit before we get to the second mystery, um, I, I like what, I, I don't know exactly how literally true it is. It may have been. I like what um, um, Russ, Russ Gibson, Mel Gibson did uh, oh. in The Passion of the Christ in this scene where he had the snake slithering around. Right. It reminded, it, it reminded us of that juxtaposition between the original Eden, Eden where the snake was, the original garden, and the Garden of Gethsemane. Oh, we have where the snake revisits the new Adam, which is Jesus. And notice how in the second garden with the new Adam and the new garden, uh, there is no Eve. I propose to you that Peter, James, and John, who are to become the, the head of the church, uh, represents that Eve. The church is the bride of Christ. Okay. The church is the feminine principle. There, so what Adam is saying is, Eve, you step aside. I'm going to deal with this. Okay. The exact opposite of what Adam did with Eve in the original garden, where he didn't do that. In fact, as Scott Hahn says, he wimped out, and he allowed Eve to be seduced by, by the, the devil. Right. So Jesus does the opposite. He fixes what Adam broke, and the, the ball of salvation begins to roll. You want to go to the second mystery? Hold on. I just okay. want to bring up, you brought up an important point going sure. back to the Garden of Eden. Uh, in, in Genesis, there's a very important line, because you brought up uh, Mel Gibson's movie. Uh, I remember this particular part of the movie where the snake is slithering around, and actually he's, he has Satan tempting him during this time, uh, saying yes. it's impossible for you to take on the sins of mankind, which is, what does Satan know? But anyways, at the very, very last moment of defiance, Yes. Uh, that 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 Jesus Jesus goes and uses his heel to stomp on the head of the serpent that's sliver, slithering around, and that goes back to Genesis, where there was this prophecy 
and it's it's a little bit ambiguous as to whether it is the woman's heel that will crush the snake's head or um the uh the descendants of that woman crushing right. the, the the snake's head yeah. uh the pronoun which, is a little ambiguous but the, yeah. the pronoun is a little bit ambiguous but it is perfect what mel gibson di did is that it, this is this is the defeat of Satan here that's happening. This is what yes. Jesus is announcing by stomping yeah. on his head. Yeah, and I, and I, again, I think that, you know, everything has form and matter, just to get a little Aristotelian with you, and including human acts. There's the formal act and there's the material act. The formal act of giving his will to the Father, the exact contrary of what Adam did, that formal act happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, you, and I think that crushing of the serpents uh, really symbolized that. And of course, the material act of that formal act occurred on the cross just the next, right. the next day. We've got about a minute left before we, have a, we, before we take a, a quick break and our only break of the show. Let's quickly uh, begin at least the scourging at the pillar that uh, Pontius Pilate basically says, I find no, um, no crime in this person. He certainly doesn't deserve um, the death penalty. Uh, why don't you just take him over there and scourge him and I'll let him go. And of course, the Jewish authorities and the crowds didn't like that, but that's at least what he did, the scourging at the pillar. Do we have another minute? Uh, a couple minutes before the break and then we'll continue. it. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, well, the, 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 I mean, there's not really that much to discuss about the scourging of the pillar. Uh, Mel Gibson's portrayal of that is, mm. is certainly brutal and, and, uh, I, I'm not sure that he was over the top with his brutality uh, in this. What we know through history, uh, the uh, primitive, this primitive uh, corporal punishment uh, yep. was brutal. Yep. And uh, in, if you include the, the, uh, the crucifixion, it was meant to scare the hell out of people. That such that they would be obedient to Rome. So this is this right. is not this is not. And and I think history also tells us that at the end of the whips of the scourging were sharp nails, glass, rocks that would dig into a person's flesh uh, as they as they whipped them. And he was scourged at least forty times, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I don't know the amount of times that he was, but the 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 the, the point of all this is that. No, this punishment is so severe. You're never going to do this sort of thing ever. Right. And anybody who witnesses it, this would think, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to disobey the Roman authorities. No uh, question. It really, it's, uh, it's very, very brutal. We need to take a, a very quick break and uh, we'll be back on the other side of this break. I want to just a, another point about the scourging and then we'll get into how the Jesus carrying his cross uh, relates to Holy Week uh, and the Passion, and of course, the crucifixion, which is the culmination right before the resurrection. Talk, get, we'll delve beneath the surface into all of this when we get back from our quick break. You're listening to Beneath the Surface. Paul Morano here with my guest, Mr. Bob LeBlanc, delving with you. Don't go away, anybody. We will be right back. Welcome back to Beneath the Surface, segment number two, as we delve beneath the surface on the topic of the five sorrowful mysteries of the rosary and how they relate to the passion of Christ. I was told uh, during the break that uh, maybe for those who are, are not Catholic or are listening to our uh, show, we should um, explain a little bit about what the rosary is. So really quickly, the rosary is a set of beads, for those who aren't familiar, and there are five decades in the rosary. And with each decade, there are certain formal prayers that you say to meditate on the mysteries of events that happened in the Bible, in the lives of Jesus and Mary with him. And so um, the five sorrowful mysteries of the rosary that are prayed are the agony of Jesus in the garden, the scourging of Jesus at the pillar. We've covered those two. Um, Jesus crowned with thorns, his carrying of the cross up, up to Mount Calvary, and the crucifixion of Christ. So just a little explanation of the rosary, which um, 
legend has it. Uh, perhaps it is um, um, historically accurate that the rosary was given to Saint uh, Dominic, was it, Bob? In a um, uh, in I an think apparition. You're right. Yes. In an apparition uh, that Mary gave the rosary, but but if you look at the rosary, it is a um, a Christian version, if you will, of what Jewish people used to do with the 150 Psalms. They used to use beads and pray the Psalms. And well, so, it, it, it's it's also true that we we do this as well. Um, we have something in the in the mm -hmm. Catholic Church called the Liturgy of Hours, right? And and the Liturgy of Hours is centered. It's it's just saturated with the Psalms. The Psalms. That's right. And so, and and so, what they've actually called the Rosary is is the poor man's Psalter, or, or you know, uh, basically, it's a layman's kind of way of praying the Psalms. Yeah, and as the Psalms uh, prefigure. Uh, Christ in the events of Jesus and Mary, the Rosary uh, speaks about um, the the events of Jesus and Mary and uh, salvation, and so that's what we meditate on with the Rosary: the joyful, the sorrowful, the glorious, and before the glorious now is the luminous. Um, and we can do all that. We can talk about that more in detail if we do a show on the Rosary. But right now, Bob, we are uh, on the second sorrowful mystery of the rosary and how it relates to the passion of Jesus and that is the scourging at the pillar and um, Jesus was scourged now usually in fact virtually always I think if you're scourged in ancient Rome you're not crucified it's one or the other and that was that was Pilate's original um, choice I'm not I, I won't crucify him but let me just we'll, we'll scourge him and, and set him free however that's not what happens well, yeah, P Pilate, I think, decided to to do the scourging as, as kind of a, a, a way to placate uh, the, crowd. Uh, the, the crowd. The mob was was pretty insistent that they didn't seem to like uh, that. And, and uh, recently we just did uh, Palm Sunday, uh, which is also called Passion Sunday. And yeah. we see we see th these two events that are separated by a relatively short period of time. I don't know how many days, but a relatively short period of time. Jesus is welcomed into Jerusalem, uh, yeah. and then a short time later, the crowd seems to turn on Jerusalem, uh, the on, Jesus. Crowd, on Jesus, at the instigation instigation of the uh, Jewish authorities, religious yeah. authorities. Yeah, yeah, and that's of course what, what is what is uh, what we uh, say during Passion Sunday, uh, that whole uh, thing uh, relating to uh, the Gospels and how that occurred. Um, one more thing I just want to say about the scourging at the pillar is I see some spiritual symbolism here too. That if you notice in the original garden, let's go back to that, what did Eve and Adam with her say about that forbidden fruit? that caused the death of mankind. Well, she said it that was pleasing. She, she saw it was good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. Good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. I see the scourging at the pillar taking care of Jesus undoing um, the first two of those things. It was good for food, sensual appetites. The scourging at the pillar scourges the body. Um, pleasing to the eyes. Again, um, aesthetic, sensual appetites. The scourging at the pillar scourges mankind for its sins of the flesh. And, um, and that's one thing that I see that Jesus, again, undoing and redeeming us from. And of course, d the, the very last thing, um, desirable for gaining wisdom. You know, a wisdom that is, I am more wise than God. Symbolically, I see this as being undone by Christ, this pride that mankind has, um, has, um, has gotten since, uh, since the, the fall of mankind in the crowning with thorns. You have, you have the crowning with thorns. He is humiliated. They put a purple cloak around him. They, they gave him a reed. They put these crown, this, this, this heavy crowns of thorns in his head, which made him profusely bleed. Some people say it, it may have even cracked his skull with the, with the, the heaviness and sharpness of those thorns, mocking him, saying, look, there's our king of the Jews. Your thoughts? Um, 
well, th th this is this is the interesting thing about the crowning is is that in a way they really were crowning a king, even though their intention was the complete to reverse. They were to, to mock, mock him, him. Yes. yes, to humiliate him. To mock him and humiliate him. Well, it it, it follows with the. Uh, I don't remember who, I think it was the high priest in, in the Gospel of John Caiaphas. that prophesied, yeah, that yeah. prophesied that it is better to For kill this one man than, that, than the entire nation die. Exactly. And, uh, exactly. and he in, truly is the Lamb of God. Yeah, well, it, it is. It, in, in a way, that is the truth. It is better that Jesus die for our sins than that we all die for our sins. And die in our sins, and which die means in our sins. eternity away from God, which means everlasting hell. So, because as we've talked about in other shows, the immortality of the soul has, is, is natural to us in the sense that it's spiritual, so it can't decompose or disintegrate. So when the body, which can do those things, dies, the soul continues, the, the soul survives bodily death. And so the question isn't whether the soul would have been annihilated the, uh, if Jesus didn't come. The question is whether or not the soul would be eternally miserable away from God in hell or Jesus, of course, came to, to take that away. Right, right. I, I also want to mention this, and, and yes. this has been brought out by uh, Peter Kraft, uh, who... who uh, has written many apologetic uh, things. He mentions that Jesus sp spilling one drop of his divine blood would be sufficient for the salvation of all men. But rather, Jesus went all in. He went in all in in order to show his love for us. And it and, and and maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but I'll say it now because it's fresh on my mind, is, is that uh, it also shows if this one drop was would infinitely satisfy Justice. And Jesus, yeah. Yeah, je that then um, it means that there is no sin that God cannot overcome, that his mercy also is infinite. Uh, yeah, that is huge. That is huge. Um, I don't know how true what Kreef said. Maybe it is true. Um, but just the fact that Jesus went the whole distance and crucified himself tells us that perhaps um, mankind would not have been convinced that God loves them had, had this not happened. And, yeah, I I, and, I, and I do love what you said, which is hugely important and is so true that even though our sins are infinitely graver than we could ever imagine because they are sins against the law of, in the, in the, in the love and majesty of God, the mercy of God, the power of God's mercy is infinitely even greater than that. Yes. That is something huge that we all have to understand. So many people are continue to hide from God, continue to deny his existence in, a, in, a, in an unconscious way because they fear the truth of looking at themselves. God is like a mirror. He's light. The more we recognize God and get close to him, the, the more we see ourselves. And that can be a very scary thing if you don't understand the infinite mercy, the infinite love and mercy that God wants to bestow on every one of us. And I, I also want to mention this, because uh, what you just said keyed me on it, is the fact that people t do despair of their sins. They recognize their sins, and they despair. And this is the real problem for Judas. And, and, and uh, we, we'll, 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 it actually, it's probably appropriate right now, because we've in, in this mystery, we've gone, kind of gone past the fact that Peter also denied Jesus. But the difference between... Uh, Peter and Judas, they both were repentant, but Judas despaired. He hung himself. Um, and, yeah. and, and Peter, Peter managed to come up with the courage to return to Christ and receive forgiveness from, from, from Christ. I would imagine there is no more uncomfortable place to be than to know the gravity of your sin 
and to not know the mercy of God or not trust in it. Right, exactly. I, I can't imagine anything worse than that combination. Imagine that. that. That was, I think, still an open option for Judas. Judas could have repented from his sins. No question. And by the way, just as a little aside, one wonders what the world would have been like if Adam repented rather than started accusing Eve and God, the woman that you gave me, she's the one that made me do it. If, if he said, oh God, I, I messed up. I'm so, so sorry. Please forgive me. Instead of doing what he did, who knows? Well, I think I, I tend to think that his uh, turning to blame Eve and Eve's turning to blame Satan yep. is the effect of sin as well. Yes. As it's a consequence of it. Yeah. All right. So we've talked about uh, the agony of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, which, which begins the whole process here. Uh, Jesus being scourged by Pontius Pilate because Pilate, or at least initially, didn't want to crucify him. Um, and then Jesus crowned with thorns um, in his humility. He accepts all of these uh, sufferings. And then comes Jesus being given the cross to carry. He's all bloodied from his uh, scourging and his crowning with thorns. And he now has to carry this heavy cross up Mount Calvary to his crucifixion. Yes, yes. And, and, and uh, there is a pious... Um, traditions that talk about, and I, I think this was in the movie, Jesus hugged his cross. He embraced his cross, uh, which, which shows the depth of his obedience. Um, this, is, this is certainly not a, 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 a man-god or god-man that is shirking his duty. He is, he is embracing it totally. Yeah. He, well, actually... Again, if you look at the justification, here is the new Adam. He is embracing the new tree of life. Yes. If you think about the old Garden of Eden, um, only two trees were mentioned by name. Tree of right. life, which, he, which he, they were given to eat, uh, which would have perhaps given them continued uh, eternal life and immortality, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was forbidden. You can eat any of these trees, including the tree of life, but don't you eat that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, that's what they did, and, and humanity fell. But here you have Jesus taking, if you will, if sim symbolically look at it, from the Garden of Gethsemane, taking now the new tree of life up, perseveringly up to Mount Calvary, so that that new tree of life can be established again for, for humanity. Because remember, as soon as Adam sinned, Humanity was was uh, was blocked from the new from the tree of life by that uh, fiery cherubim in the in Genesis. But here you have Jesus taking that cross up Mount Calvary, taking that new tree of life, establishing it, and knowing that he's about to hang on it as that fruit that hangs from the new tree of life, of which if people now eat, if people now consume the new fruit, which is Jesus of the new tree of life, which is the cross, where do you, where do you consume this new fruit of the new tree of life? That's you. Well, yes. Uh, well, the one thing to remember. Well, give me, give me the answer. Where do you? You, 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 get, you get this from the cross. Yes, um, but, but literally, where do you get Oh, where do I literally get it? Well, this is, I'm this, going to answer your question. Just let me fruit. go through. Just let me go through where I get it. And, and, but I want, to, I want to preface it with a little bit of an explanation uh, because I think a lot of people separate these three different things in the triduum. Yeah. Um, if you look at it liturgically, the, the Holy Thursday Mass, Good Friday service, and the Easter Vigil, they are all one unit. Yeah. If you, if you really look at it, you are not dismissed. You do, the, the priest does not say the Mass is ended at the end of the Holy uh, Thursday Mass. And for those who are non-Catholic, after every single Mass, church service for Catholics, um, that's what he says. Mass is ended, says. go in peace. Here, he doesn't say that because they are three um, elements of the same whole. Right, right. Yeah. And and Good Friday is not a Mass. It's the, the one day that you don't celebrate Mass anywhere in the world. Uh, and so it's it's a service. What's left over with host you're consuming, and then 
this thing is all completed in the resurrection. And so what, what is happening here is that the Eucharist, which is the answer that you were looking for. The answer to my question, thank you. Is, is, is the fruit of the tree. And we receive that fruit of the tree from the mass, which is every mass is a, a, a summation of these three separate elements all combined together. The Last Supper, the crucifixion and death of our Lord, and yes. then the resurrection. Represented. Represented. All represented. Yeah. And so you not not just remembered, but literally represented. Those three acts are because God is eternal, He's outside of time. Those three acts and their effectiveness comes to us, and we are affected by them celebrating at Mass, every single Mass we, we're at. Right. And so the priest is, is, is going through, especially in the, the consecration of the bread and the wine, which turns into the body and blood of Jesus. Um, that happens every mass. And the mass is not a mass without that happening. Yes. And, and so then where we complete that, we receive the fruits of this, the fruits of the crucifixion and resurrection which are the pair of our salvation history, we receive that love yeah. from Jesus. And Holy Thursday, the Thursday during Holy Week, is when uh, it is celebrated, that first Eucharist, which was Passover that Jesus took and made it the new Passover, of course, of the new covenant, whereas Jesus becomes the new Moses, leads people through this life into the next when we are completely freed of sin, including the, uh, the sin that's still in our, in our human nature via original sin. And so um, we have the crowning of thorns, the, the carrying of Jesus on the cross. We only have a couple of few minutes left. Let's get to the pinnacle, and then we'll talk about what this can all, how we can all share in, in all of this in our spiritual lives. The pinnacle of this, the fifth sorrowful mystery, the crucifixion. Yes, and, and uh, so this is where Jesus dies. And, and this is, uh, a lot of times, one of the theories is that Jesus just swooned. He didn't really die. Um, this is not, this is not what the Romans intended. They made sure that people died. And in fact, we have the evidence in scripture of that with the piercing of, of Jesus' uh, chest with, by the Roman soldier's uh, spear. That's right. Uh, to ensure it. And water and blood came out, which is something that proves that Jesus was dead at that point in time. And it also has symbolic meaning. Uh -huh. uh, we, we get through through his blood and water. That's where we get uh, this this the water of baptism. But we yeah. also get the, the the blood that washes us clean. Uh, yeah. And which 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 is in the Eucharist which is in the Eucharist, and that harkens back to Exodus as well, where, where Moses would sprinkle blood on, on the Israelites from the, the slaughtered lamb. Very good. And you know, it harkens back to Genesis too. And again, the juxtaposition, juxtaposition between the Adam and Eve story and the Jesus-Mary story. Um, what happened when Adam was in a deep, God put him in a deep sleep, and out of his side, you could say his rib, but you could also say out of his heart came his other half, his female uh, partner, Eve. Uh, what happens in the deep sleep of the cross with the new Adam? The church is born. The church is born. The, the, the feminine principle, the bride of Christ, just like Eve to Adam, is born out of Jesus right there in the cross, uh, with symbolized here by, by, uh, by the grace of water and blood, baptism in the Eucharist, the... the, the uh, the, the sacraments that initiate people into the church, the bride of church, bride of Christ is born. Uh, one more thing, and then I want to just talk about, because we only have two minutes left, about uh, how we can enter into all this. And that is that um, one thing that Jesus said in one of the Gospels, I think it was Luke, was right before he died, he said, it is consummated. It is, yeah, it is finished. Some, 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 uh, inter some uh, translations say it is finished. Others say it is consummated. What happens when a groom uh, finally becomes one with his bride. Right, consummation. The yes. relationship is consummated. It was actually, um, you could say that the consent of the, of the marital type relationship occurred in um, the Garden of Gethsemane, where basically 
Jesus gave up his will with his I do to the Father. And here, the relationship between Christ and his groom is consummated, uh, where his very life is given to his bride, just like in the, in the, in the, in the consummated act of, of a bride and a groom, his life is given to his bride. And now the bride has his life, is impregnated with his life like the church is impregnated with his grace. A uh, couple minutes left. Why don't you go over perhaps uh, some of the spiritual benefits and how we can enter into this during this Holy Week? Well, the, the, the spiritual benefits are, are really in the preparation, I think. We, we prepare for this during Lent, and then we, we celebrate. We, it, this is, we, we, we enter into it ourselves. Uh, we're doing this all the time through the rosary, but the high point of all the Christian celebration is to enter into this on Holy Thursday, Good Friday, in the Easter Vigil. And it's the, the pinnacle of any sacrifice and suffering that we've been doing during Lent, right? Right, right. I mean, we, we certainly, it's, it's, it certainly doesn't end. And in fact, we have a huge Easter season yes. uh, that, that follows. I, I believe it's seven weeks, seven weeks of Easter season yeah. following uh, uh, this. And this is all a celebration of the resurrection because that is really the point of all this this is yeah the, the this is the reward the resurrection which we hope for ourselves so jesus conquers death he begins the new uh creation uh the first fruits of the new creation anybody who knows, knows agriculture knows the first fruits are picked first and then later every every all the other fruits are picked at the last day of, of history uh all people will be resurrected um those to either to uh to glory uh, are those to damnation, heaven and hell. But bodily and a whole person resurrection is first uh, celebrated with the head of the mystical person of Christ, the mystical body, which is Jesus himself on Easter Sunday. Last word, Mr. Bobbert. Well, yes, uh, we, let's hope for all our resurrection into heaven here. Uh, Amen. Amen. So, so, so obviously what's more important than that, being with God for all eternity. Thank you, Bob LeBlanc. You, it, was a, it was a fun show to do. Thanks a lot for uh, delving beneath the surface with us. Thank you, Paul. And thank you all for listening. And you have been listening to Beneath the Surface. Glad you could join us tonight. Have a great Holy Week, a great Easter season. And um, until next time, Paul Morano signing off. Beneath the Surface, God bless. <laughs>